where he was counseling with a woman and her husband. He was meeting with the woman and there was actually a, a hand placed on a forearm by this priest. And somehow that was interpreted by some others as being much more than that. And he was in a mess. Uh, and he was inhibited from doing any counseling. He was allowed to stay at the church, but it was going to be the end of his career if it did not go well. It was the, it was the bell that cannot be unrung. And so we always need to be aware of those things and what we're doing when we're getting to that point of whether or not there's going to be a presentment or what type of discipline is going to go forward. Anyway, he was given an, an, an admonition, and in this admonition, he was to receive some initial psychological counseling, and then he was also to go through a process that it must have been, uh, and some of you that were active in the uh, College of Bishops with the Episcopal Church at that time might have remembered it, but everything was going to Arizona. He was going to have to go out to some place called Red Rock or somewhere like that and go through this boundary training that cost more than the psychological counseling. And he didn't have the money to do it. So the time was coming to the end of his godly admonition, which had a timeline at the end that he had to complete it by, and he didn't have the money to get it done. And so he received a call from the bishop's office to come in for an appointment. And he said, uh, he called his friend, and his friend called me, and we went. And we had a meeting, set a time for another meeting, and I was able to then do some legwork, and I determined that the diocese had, just a few years before, paid, thousand, paid about $19,000 for some psychological counseling for the spouse of a clergy member who had been arrested for shoplifting. And it turned out that she had a real psychological issue that was causing that, and they paid for that counseling. Uh, we went back, and we had, it was sort of a, a small, it was a small hearing, you know what? And uh, the bishop said, uh, well, Jeff, what do, you, what do you propose? And I said, well, I propose that uh, clergyman X receive at least the same benefits as the spouses in our diocese because uh, quite frankly I think our diocesan medical insurance is lacking in uh, the psychological care provision and uh, the <coughs> chancellor and the bishop went out and they came back in and we discussed a little bit more and they came back in a little bit later and uh, said uh, how much time do you want and how much money is it going to take so there are things that we can stop occasionally after the call comes in and it's come over here. There was some bad conduct, some bad deportment, uh, nothing in his record, but he was headed over here for violation of the admonition. He was headed over to this side of the chart. So that was uh, a wonderful, uh, wonderful opportunity and a Glad to be able to share that because God showed up in a special way. Uh, it often doesn't go uh, that well. Okay, this is now. Let me say, let me say a couple words about godly admonition in a vision before we go uh, any further. Godly admonitions, how we treat them, is clearly set out in the canons. Uh, and that's, if there's a presentable, even before a presentable offense, uh, is processed uh, to prevent serious harm, uh, you can still do a godly in, uh, inhibition. Or even if the behavior is continuing and you've had, it, uh, the bishop's had a discussion with the uh, deacon or presbyter and the behavior's not changing, you can go ahead and issue a godly admonition with uh, requirements. And for us, it is a written directive from a bishop with jurisdiction to a member of the clergy under his jurisdiction. It shall be issued until the bishop has, or shall not be issued until the bishop has met personally with the member of the clergy, unless 
for a valid reason, the bishop shall have delegated such meeting to another bishop, and the issues have been clearly and fairly discussed. The written admonition shall be specific concerning the matter complained of and the canonical or theological basis for the complaint, and shall have a reasonable time for the required action to be taken. Godly admonition is an extremely versatile tool in the bishop's toolbox. It's amenable to almost any situation in which uh, a higher level of behavior is desired or a cessation of not proper behavior is desired. It's uh, a tremendous tool. Uh, it can include and has included in the past down through the history of the canon law uh, things even as a lot of the spiritual retreat, renewal. It could also go from there to some additional training, some psychological counseling, some other type of counseling. Uh, and it's just a tremendous opportunity uh, at, an early, at the earliest possible level, which is where we should always look to resolve matters, to modify and improve behavior. Now, if the clergy does not obey the godly admonition, then just as we say in item number 12 uh, of the list of the 12 under, uh, under our canons, uh, that that in and of itself can be a basis for a presentment. If you look through the uh, canons and the canon uh, history, uh, godly admonitions have been preliminary means used by the church towards a member of the clergy both as a preventative of harm and or the remedy for behavior. They can be used in a positive injunctive manner as well. And it can be particularly useful in modifying or amending behavior which if left in its regular state in its natural course at that point could lead to a presentable action. They can be used in conjunction with suggestions for additional study, and uh, anything that the bishop feels is necessary uh, to bring this clergy person back into good authority, good order, and good behavior. Inhibitions uh, under our canons now, particularly after the amendment this year, can be used with uh, a godly admonition or on their own. And inhibitions uh, should be used when, canons should be used whenever and wherever uh, presbyter or deacon should be temporarily inhibited from the exercise of ministry, and that's when the bishop believes that upon reasonable grounds that it is in the best interest of the accusers, the church, and or the accused to do so, depending upon an accusation, a con or pending an accusation, canonical investigation, presentment, trial, or there's a voluntary submission of the clergy <clears throat> to discipline under these canons. They can be extended with the uh, agreement and approval of the standing uh, committee uh, until the entire matter uh, in this charge is either dropped, action taken by the trial court, or under the proposed language that we have uh, or the uh, accused voluntarily submit to the discipline of the church. In canon law, inhibitions have always represented a form of ecclesiastical censure. Uh, Bill talked about that. The, the bishop may use inhibition to suspend the clergy person from the performance of any or all religious service, other spiritual duty, to enforce obedience of a godly admonition or other order from the bishop. Inhibitions are at the discretion of the ordinary if he considers the continued performance of spiritual duties by the offending clergy person might result in scandal. And these all have application here. The case that I was talking about, which did resolve well, was over here, which was not going to be able to be uh, completed and then that would come back over to
to this side. We're now down to what is the fulcrum of our disciplinary process, and that's uh, Title IV, Canon Three, section, of, well, the entire section, really, for accusations. Uh, the accusation section, uh, Phil talked about the process of when we put our Constitution and Canons together. It was only at the last reading before the Provincial Council in Bedford, which took place in, in April here in Dallas, that the section that said it had to be in writing was inserted and sworn to. Uh, because we were so uh, concerned that we do follow due process, natural law, and that persons in the process have the benefits of those. And uh, uh, a canon lawyer brought that up to uh, Archbishop Bob's attention. And uh, I, think, I think he misunderstood the question a little bit, but he was a little bit annoyed because we were in such a late hour, we were going through a word-by-word -word reading for the last time in April of, uh, of 08, oh, excuse me, 09. And, uh, uh, but there was a break and 